Hi, my name's Andy, and this is a video about Elm, what it feels like uh, to program in Elm. I'm hoping to do an, uh, uh, more in the series that will be the specifics of um, how to use Elm, what the syntax is like, and all that stuff. You're going to see a little bit of that there, but really this is about what it feels like to use it, and the clues in the title about how it makes me feel. It makes me happy. So, uh, why does it make me happy? What's it like? Well, it's... Uh, very immediate. Uh, it, uh, Elm is a functional programming language which for me has always meant it's been hard for me to know how to even begin using it. Um, but with Elm you're straight in there very quickly uh, getting something up on the screen uh, and easy to understand. Uh, it, but it's still very clean. It's, it's, it's modelled on the very clean functional languages that you get these days and the model that you use to uh, uh, interact with the world and make make your websites um, it's very clean and uh, it's, it's hard to end up trampling on the wrong bit of code at the wrong time, um, which is a contrast with JavaScript. Um, it's also, for someone who's not used to that syntax and that way of working, it can be very frustrating, um, but ultimately it's very rewarding. Um, I should say what Elm is. Elm is a, um, it's an alternative to uh, JavaScript and HTML for making dynamic websites, and it compiles into um, JavaScript and HTML. So um, the people who are using your website don't know you're using Elm necessarily, um, but you can do things in a much cleaner and safer feeling and more fun uh, way. Okay, so let's start with how immediate it is. So um, this little Elm program here is displaying the position of my mouse, um, and the full listing of that program is written below it. So it takes three lines of Elm. Literally, that is the whole program. Um, to make this little grey box which is shown um, where my mouse is. It's got a couple of imports and then it's a one-liner to print the mouse position on the screen. I won't go into exactly what all that stuff means. I will do in future videos. Um, but suffice it to say, getting something up on the screen that responds to what the user's doing is really fast and immediate. Um, what else? Well, uh, in order to just uh, see how numbers and values and things work in Elm, uh, you can use the uh, REPL, which is the interactive environment for Elm. And if you type in 3 plus 5, you get back 8. And it says colon number. It tells you what type it is. So Elm is a strongly typed programming language, but normally you don't need to say, uh, the or often you don't need to say the types, although it does help me if I do. Um, but it will figure out the types often, and that's what it's done here. And then uh, for the second example, there you can see if you type in a, something in quotes, um, then that's a string. So it, uh, from that point of view, stuff like that looks a lot like uh, a language that you might be familiar with, like Python or JavaScript. Um, uh, here's a little bit more. If you want to make a variable uh, called x, you just say x equals 3, uh, and it tells you underneath that it's, uh, the, the value of x is 3, because you've just made it 3. And then if you can ask what is x plus 2, you get 5. So again, it looks pretty familiar. If you've done Python, these would be basically it the identical commands to what you would type in Python to do the same things. Uh, the meaning of them is really quite different when you get into it. Uh, then this is how you make a function. Uh, so you just give the name of the function and then you say what arguments it takes. And notice that there aren't commas or brackets, which you might be used to if you uh, are yeah, doing Python, JavaScript, uh, Java, C Sharp, anything like that. If you want to define a function, you just say the name of it, and then a space, and then a list of arguments separated by spaces. So here, this is a function called double that takes in an argument we're calling x, and then the body of the function just goes on the right-hand side of the equals sign. So the body of the function is x times 2. So the function double uh, takes in an x and returns double it. Um, and below you can see it's figured out the type of your function for you. So it says, right, I've made you a function, and its type is something that takes in a number and returns a number. Um, so notice that defining a function looks an awful lot like defining a variable. You just say something equals something. Um, and that's deliberate because you can treat functions the same way you can treat variables in a lot of ways. Um, and that turns out to be really handy and nice. Anyway, the point about this is it's pretty straightforward and immediate, although it is unfamiliar if you're not coming from um, uh, a language which looks like this already. Uh, and so the, down below you can see how you call a function. So to call the function double, you just say double space and then give it its arguments separate by spaces again. So again, no brackets and no commas, which you might be used to, but you can see when you say what uh, double for, it gives you back eight. 
So that's how you define a function. Uh, you can uh, just to show you, you can define a function which takes in two arguments. So here, uh, this function sum of squares takes in two arguments a and b, and then on the right hand side is the definition of that function, which is just a squared plus b squared. So you can use the carry symbol there to do uh, squared, and you can see that it, again it's figured out that the type of this thing is a function, and the type of function it is, and this is this is slightly hard to read. But basically, the thing on the far right is the return value, and then the things before that are the argument. So this is the function that takes in two numbers and returns the number. Um, and the reason why it's written like that, where the return value just looks like another thing in the list, um, we'll get to in later videos. But basically, it makes for some pretty cool stuff. But don't think about it yet if this is the first time you've seen it. So anyway, this is how you call uh, a fu the function sum of squares with two arguments. You just say sum of squares, 3 space 4. It gives you back the answer, 25. Okay, a little bit more about how immediate Elm is. You can do really fun things um, really easily. So I've made a little program that makes this I follow my mouse around the screen. Um, and I have cheated slightly because what's below isn't the full code for it because I've missed out the imports at the top. But except for the imports at the top, this is the full code for this um, this little program where an eye follows my mouse around the screen. So you can see it's good for interactive websites. So this this kind of example shows you it's good for a game. In a minute we'll see an example that shows you it could be good for um, more boring type applications as well. Uh, anyway, so the whole program is there. Basically you've got a main method that does something clever that we won't think about uh, in this video. And, then, and what that does is it calls, um, it tells it to call the scene function every time it gets a new mouse position. So the scene function takes in an argument which is made up of two things, the x and the y positions of the mouse. Um, and it produces this to uh, uh, so the right hand side of the equals. So the scene brackets x, y is the beginning of the definition of the scene function. Um, and what it does is calls a function called collage, which is built into Elm. And that basically makes a canvas on your HTML page. Um, and that collage function takes in several arguments, it takes in the 400, 100, which is the size of the canvas. And then the rest of that stuff um, until the empty line, that's the next argument. And that basically says, here's a list of things to draw on that canvas. And what it wants to draw is an outlined circle with a default line, so that's the outside of the eye. And then on the next line down, it's going to draw the the black part of the eye. Um, so basically, that's a filled black circle. You can see it says filled black circle of size 10. Um, but we have to say where to put it, so the move part moves that filled black circle to the right position. That's the way you, you compose things on a on a collage. You you say, make me a circle, but then you say, uh, but don't put it in the sort of middle, put it by move it to this place. So that's what that move means. And then, uh, but down below you can see a function called iPos, which is basically a little bit of math to figure out where to draw the eye. Uh, anyway, uh, so we, we don't need to go into the, all the details of exactly how this works, but what you, what you can see from that is that this is a six-line program plus some imports uh, that does something really quite fun and uh, interactive. So uh, my point is Elm is very immediate, so it's very uh, quick to get uh, started producing something on the screen that you can see and you can figure out how it works. Uh, and the Elm uh, website has a load of examples and all of the examples have the code on the left and then ha the thing uh, the thing that the code does on the right and you can edit the code and then just say click a button and it and it updates the program so it's really really immediate to just play around and figure out uh, experiment with how it works uh, another factor of how immediate it is is how quickly can I actually get it installed and running and the answer is pretty quick. If you're on an uh, Ubuntu or Debian type machine, uh, um, this is basically what you need to type. Certainly on an Ubuntu machine, this is what you need to type um, to get Elm running and write a little Elm program and have it actually running. So the first line is an apt get line to say install, basically install Node.js on different things. That might just be called Node, but on some Ubuntus it's called Node.js legacy. Anyway, the point is uh, the first line just means install Node.js, and if you're on Windows or Mac, you have to find your own way of installing Node.js. Once you've got Node.js, you just use npm to say install Elm, so that's the second line. npm is part of Node.js. So just install Elm. Once you've got Elm installed, we can write a little program. So the third line, the echo, and then the, the bit in blue that comes after that, is just saying that's the, the full text of a tiny little Elm program. 
uh, and it writes it into a file called main main.elm. And then, so now we've written our Elm program. So now the line that says Elm Reactor, that basically means start up the, this Elm thing, which will basically compile your code on the fly and have it all ready and uh, working for you. And it starts a little web server so that you can immediately see your um, Elm program. So you just type Elm Reactor, and then you point your browser at localhost colon 8000 slash main.elm. Uh, so basically, the Elm Reactor thing starts up a little web server, and you go in your browser to uh, that localhost address, and um, when you go there, Elm Reactor will compile your code, and it'll tell you if it didn't compile properly, blah, blah, blah. And uh, assuming it works, you get something like the screenshot you can see there, where you've got the, the mouse position showing in your Firefox window, um, or whatever browser you prefer. So, you know... Type five things, you've got a running Elm program. That's pretty good um, in terms of being immediately accessible. Uh, uh, but Elm is not only immediate, it's also extremely clean. So, I mean, a lot of things are immediate. You could say that um, JavaScript's pretty quick to have up and running as well, even even easier perhaps. Uh, Python's pretty quick to have up and running on a, a Linux machine. Not too bad on a non Linux machine. Um, but the thing about Elm is that you've got all that immediacy, but you've also got this really strong purity um, and cool stuff that makes it harder to write bad code, harder to write bugs. Um, so that's why it's attractive. Uh, so here I've got a little application um, that I wrote in Elm. It's quite short, and I'll show you some of the code from it um, over the next few slides. But this is just to illustrate the kind of thing that can go wrong and be difficult when you're writing uh a dynamic website. So um, this is just a little form where it asks you to enter your email and it asks you to enter it again to make sure you typed it right, which you may or may not find annoying. But anyway, this is the kind of thing we want to do. So, so like a, uh, it could be just a very dumb form, but we these days we want this type of thing to be highly interactive. So we, if we type an email address into the, or if we type some rubbish into the um, first box. We can see uh, we, a little X appears, which tells us that that's not a valid email address. But if I just put, make it look like a valid email address, then uh, uh, we get a little green tick appearing next to it. And if I go into the type an email again box and I start typing, um, you can see by the way that the submit button is not um, uh, not clickable yet um, because we haven't typed our two emails right. But also now, now I've started typing something into that second box. Uh, if it doesn't match the thing in the top box, we've got a little X telling us that that doesn't match. So if I if I type it correctly, um, you can see a little tick appeared, and now the submit button is active. So this is just the kind of um, thing uh, you might want to write in um, an interactive website. And uh, the reason I'm using it as an example is it's already got quite a few moving parts. So we need... Um, we need a ticker across on the first box and a ticker across on the second box down to different criteria. We need to enable or disable the submit button. And if I was writing this in JavaScript, I'd already be feeling a little bit uncomfortable, probably, that um, that I might have missed one of the cases or um, the um, uh, you know if I do things in a different order, it might not enable the submit button every time or something like that. And you have to be a bit careful in your JavaScript to write. Um, uh, write it in a way that, that is kind of robust to that type of thing. And if you then, if this then becomes part of a larger form, you're likely to miss things or, or you, c you can't feel very sure that you've definitely covered everything. So what Elm and other, um, reactive programming systems give you is a lot more certainty that you've, you've done things in the right way. So, um, I feel really confident that that submit button will only be enabled when you've typed in the right stuff into the right boxes, and if I change this so they don't match, you can see the submit button is no longer enabled, and the little X appears saying the second box is not the same as the first box. So I feel really confident that all the all the possible different interactions that there could be um, are always going to end up uh, with the right uh, response from my program because of the way the the Elm program is structured, and this is part of what makes me happy about it. I'm no longer worried that I've missed some cases um, and things like that. So how does that? How does it give me that feeling of uh, happiness and uh, security? 
Well, basically, through the, the what's called the functional reactive programming model that, that Elm uses. So basically, there's this thing called a model, which which represents the kind of state of the world. So in the email program, that, that the model is basically the two email addresses that you've typed in. And it might also be whether or not you've ticked a box, or it might be where your character is in a game or something like that. So the model is, is everything, all the sort of data, all the information about what is there, what is happening. Um, and that is basically stored in Elm as, as like a, a you know a variable, um, which contains all kinds of other data. You know, it's normally a, a map type variable, or something like that, or a list. Um, and uh, it's very very clear what the model is. And if something uh, is not in the model, then it can't really be displayed on the screen, or it can't be persisted. So. Um, Elm makes it very, very clear that you know exactly what your model is. It lets you break up your model into little bits, so you can write um, uh, the smaller modules of code, but you always know that the stuff you've combined together to make your model, you know exactly what it is. You can see very clearly what's all the state in the system. If you compare that with, um, often when I'm programming in JavaScript, some of the state of the system is possibly implicit. It's, it's to do with whether or not a particular function has happened at a certain time. Um, it's not even necessarily represented by a variable at all, let alone uh, by a, a variable where which I can easily identify and clearly see this is the state. Um, so um, that's the model. And then in order to display stuff on the screen, what you do is you write a function called view, which looks at the model and produces um, a description of what it wants to appear on the screen, which is normally um, uh, the, the HTML page saying, you know, I want a div with this in and an input box with this in and so on, an image like over here and, and a paragraph here and so on. Um, and so that's your view, basically a function that takes the model and says this is what the page should look like. And once you've done that view, you hand that off to the Elm stuff and Elm does the dirty work of making the screen really look like that. You just describe the screen you want um, and Elm uh, makes the screen look like that and it does that in an efficient way so if you care about performance this is really quite a high performance uh, system um, but you don't have to care about uh, actually making changes to the browser DOM model which can get quite messy you just give the the representation of what you want to Elm and it just makes it right and it does it by doing the kind of minimum amount of work that it can so that's why it's fast okay so once that's happened um, something is going to happen in your world like uh, the user clicks on something or a timer goes off that says you know it's been a second since the last time you did something or whatever and you're going to need to change your model so what you do is you write a function called update and that the update function tells you how to tells Elm how to change the model so the update function takes in a description of what happened uh, and there's, and that's taken from a kind of very clearly defined list of possible things that might happen. So rather than having events that could be scattered all over your code, and event listeners or whatever, um, you've just got this, this one place called update, which takes in all the possible things that might have happened. And again, that description of what might have happened can be broken up into nice discrete modules and, and you can develop them separately and so on. You can do that. But at the time when you're combining them together, you have this one update function that, that farms out the work to the different modules that you're using. Um, and uh, and it's very very clear exactly what's happened. The um, the list of all the possible things that might happen is is clearly visible. The update function farms out the work to update the model based on what happened. And because this because Elm is a functional programming language, um, rather than the update function going in and changing a variable to say the model now you know used to look like this and now looks like this the way update works is it takes in the old model as an argument and its return value is the new model so no, nothing ever changes uh in elm things just get returned so underneath uh, what's inside the kind of elm world the elm interpreter the bit that you're not you're not involved with then stuff is changing, you know, like the DOM, the browser DOM itself is changing and stuff like that. And the, the Elm will replace its kind of current model with the new thing you return, having previously been the thing it gave you. So you pass in a model to update, um, <clears throat> it passes in a model to update, you pass back the new model that you want, and that becomes the new model that then the view function gets called to redisplay it. And you keep going round and round in this cycle with really well-defined set of um, things that, that can exist called the model, a really well-defined set of things that can happen called the update, and then a really well-defined way of saying uh, if, if, if this 
stuff is currently the case, then this is what he's going to look like on the screen. And you feel in control in a way that you never did when there were events and variables all over the place flying around. If this is all sounding very centralised to you, Elm does have a, a message for that. Uh, um, and if you look at the page on the Elm website called the Elm Architecture, it helps you see how you can break this down into a kind of not centralised smaller bits. But for now, what I'm focusing on is how clean and safe it all feels. So let's have a little bit more of a, a look at that. Um, if you look at the model for this email um, form that we were talking about earlier, here's the model. Uh, and the top part of the screen, it, uh, the pop top part of this list is um, the definition of the type of model. So we haven't talked much about how you define types, but here's an example of it. It basically says this is like a an object. Um, it's like a map type object. So in JavaScript, you just call this an object. Um, so it, it contains it can contain two things. Uh, called email one and email two, and both of those have got to be strings. So that's the, what the top half means, and the bottom half is um, a function called model which creates an empty model. So basically, it, what that does is returns one of these objects where email one and email two are both set to the empty string. So that's how you define your model, and that's how you, you set it up initially. It's got to start off being something, so here we start off with two empty boxes. Uh, and then once we've got a model, we want to look at it on the screen. So we look at the view. This is looking at the view function. The view takes in two arguments, address and model. We won't talk about address at the moment, but that's basically how how things that the user um, does end up getting understood by Elm. Um, but uh, what I wanted to show you here was this is the part of the model that displays the submit button. So I've missed out some of the other bits. Um, but basically, the submit button's in a div, and then it's a button. Uh, and the text of the button is submit and then that button is either disabled or not disabled and I, I've delegated the work of deciding whether or not the button is disabled or not disabled to a separate function which is called submit disabled and that takes in an argument which is the model so basically given the, the current state of the world which is the, the two emails that have been typed in uh, should uh, should the button be disabled or not and in fact it returns a, a like an HTML attribute which says disabled equals true or disabled equals false. So you can see here this code with div and button and things like that looks like HTML. It's the words from HTML, but it's Elm style code. So what we're doing here is we're describing the HTML DOM that we want to Elm by using Elm functions called things like div and button and text. Um, so we just return one of these things by calling these Elm functions. And Elm figures out actually modifying the DOM so that it looks like that. So that's what that is. Uh, so here's the submit disabled button. So that basically calls this another function in the Elm library called disabled, which is basically gives you back an, an HTML attribute which says disabled equals true or disabled equals false. And the way it decides whether it's going to be true or false is the, the bit in brackets after the word disabled. So basically the, the logic here is uh, either uh, both E uh, email one is a valid email, so the first thing it, it, is it calls a function called valid email and passes in email one as the argument, and then it has ampersand ampersand, which means and. So both email one is a valid email and email one equals email two. So that's the second line down after the ampersand ampersand. Um, so basically, it's saying if if email one is an email address and email two is the same as email one, then the submit button is enabled. And then checking whether it's a valid email address, you can see I've just done a really noddy thing down the bottom there. I've just said it's a valid email address if it contains an at sign. You probably want to do better than that, but this is an example. Okay, so that was the view function. So the other thing that we're missing, we haven't done so far, is the update function. And the update function is the bit that takes in a model and what happened and returns a new model. So the top part um, is the definition of the type of thing that can happen. So there's a type. This is a type called action, and uh, this is something that will be really quite unfamiliar if you're not used to um, functional languages like Haskell and things like that. But this is um, what you could call what gets called, I think, a union type. But it's basically um, it's a, it's a it's a type which could be one of two things. So rather than it being an interface where it could be anything that inherits that interface or something like that in in a language like Java, what we're saying here is that an action there's there is a thing called action, and what that is is it's either an email one changed or it's an email two changed. So that's what that bit means. And also, um, 
it's telling you a little bit about what an email one changed is. So it's doing two things at once, that this top bit. It's saying what an action is, and it's saying what an email one changed is, and what an email two changed is. And basically, what an email one changed is, is it's it's a thing called e of type email one changed, which has got a string in it. Anyway, so the point is, uh, we've got a definition of all the possible things that could happen in the world, and the only things that can happen in this world are that um, uh, you changed email number one or you changed email number two, and in both cases. Uh, we need to know what you changed it to. So email one changed has got a string in it because it's going to be that you changed email one to this. Uh, notice that you, there's no action that says both of them got changed at the same time because that can't happen. Uh, what will happen is you change one of them and then uh, and the update cycle will happen and then, then you change the other one later. So either one changed or the other changed, not both at the same time. They would come, they'd come one after another. So one of the nice things about this model is that while, when you're writing your update function, you only have to worry about one thing happening at a time. They, they, they're not allowed to cross over. There's no uh, to, uh, one event starts firing while another event's still happening or anything like that. So the actual update function is, is, is the bottom half. So it's, it's a function called update, which takes in two arguments, the action and the model. And then the, the code below is basically what to do. So we've got this thing called case, which is a bit like a switch statement in other languages, which basically says, based on the type of thing action is. So in the switch statement, you say, um, in something like Java, or you say, um, do something based on the, what's in this variable. But in a case statement here, you're saying do something based on what type of variable it is. Or it's actually more complicated because it can do, it can sort of match patterns of things. But for here, all we're using it for is to just check what type of thing the action is. So as I said before, an action can be either an email one changed or an email two changed. And in each case, uh, it contains a string, which is what the email got changed to. So what we're basically saying here is if uh, the action is an email one changed, then get hold of the string inside it which uh, by calling it s. And then your return value should be the rest of the stuff in the curly brackets there. And, and then exa almost exactly the same code again to say if, if action is an email to changed, then, uh, call, call the string that's inside it, i.e. The, the, what you change the email to, s, and then do this stuff in the curly brackets. And then the curly bracket thing is basically, uh, saying take model, and then give me a modified version of model. So take everything in model and keep it all exactly the same as it was before, except change these specific things. So in this case, in the top one, we're saying, uh, give me give me model as it was before, except it set email one to be S instead of what it was before. And then at the bottom, it's exactly the same, except we're setting email two to be S. So basically, as I was saying, you take in a model. So the second argument to the update function is a model. And you return a changed model. So both of these two possible um, <clears throat> places where you return, which are the curly brackety things, um, we're saying take the old model that you had, but 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 return a modified version of it, which is modified in this way. So that's just that that curly bracket thing with the pipe symbol in it is is a convenient thing because you need to do this type of stuff a lot in in a language where you can't change something. Normally you would just say I want to change model if you're in a um, a language with mutable variables, you'd say model dot email one equals this, but you're that's not what you're doing here. You're not changing model. You're returning a new copy of model with one thing in it changed, or, or actually that um, syntax can be used to change more than one thing. But we're only using it for one thing here. So that was what an update function looks like. So in summary, why it feels clean is because everything that you can care about, that, that, that any kind of state in the system at all, is held in that thing called model. It's really well defined what represents the state of the system you can just go and look at what's what type the type of model and you know exactly what what gets stored and if you need to store something else you need to change model and then everything that you can possibly see uh, is defined in that view function everything that can possibly happen is defined in that update function and normally that update function will be a case statement like we saw which just sort of switches between all the possible things that might happen and then probably it delegates out that work to other functions that do the, the real work so there's no more guesswork about what events might happen in what order and what will the state of this variable be if this event happens in the middle of me processing that event. You know, all of that's gone. No more guesswork. And that feels really comfortable when you're... Certainly when I write JavaScript code, I, I very quickly start feeling really paranoid that I haven't covered everything I should have covered. Um, but Elm is also quite frustrating. So you're going to see a lot of 
uh, error messages that you don't understand. And if you if you're used to JavaScript, where it doesn't it, JavaScript doesn't care what type of thing it is, it'll just fail later. Um, you're going to be asking yourself, why on earth do I have to do what this compiler is telling me all the time? But um, I I think once you get used to it, you're going to be really glad uh, that you, you did, because actually what the compiler is telling you is there's something wrong in your program. And in a, in a language like JavaScript that doesn't check this stuff, you just don't find out there's something wrong in your program until later, and that's worse. Anyway, you're going to see a lot of arguments where you you wanted to call a function and then pass the answer to another function or something like that. You got your brackets in the wrong place, uh, or you, you you put a comma when you shouldn't, or you didn't put a comma where you should, or something like that. You're going to see a lot of things like this. So what this is saying is uh, your function that you called myfn takes in one argument, but you're trying to pass two in here, probably because you don't understand the syntax, which is why I've been spending a lot of time with pain like that. Um, but notice that it shows you the line of code the line number is on the left there, that's what the 2 is. Um, and it shows you your code formatted in the way you formatted it. And it makes some suggestions about uh, what you might have done wrong, like maybe you forgot some parentheses. So even when it's frustrating, it's really trying its best to be helpful to you. Other things you might see, uh, just that things are the wrong type. So here, um, a main method always has to have a particular type. And some of those types are really confusing types like signal element, which is really going to confuse you until you get used to it. But you just sort of go with it and ignore it until eventually you get your head around it. Um, but anyway, it's going to tell you, I expected this kind of type and you gave me that kind of type. And you're going to be really annoyed by that. Um, but it helps you because actually when you figure out what was wrong, you realize you put a bug into your program um, that you hadn't noticed and the compiler is telling you about it. Uh, here's another example of just this signal business. It took me a long time to have any clue what a signal was, what an address was, and why I had to care. Um, so, yeah, just try and read what it's telling you. And in particular, often what you've done, or what, often what I've done when I get a confusing error message is I've, I've forgotten to put some brackets around something. So if you want to call a function and then use the answer from that function, um, as an argument to another function. You've got to put brackets around it. Bracket before the name of the function and after the last argument um, to say, do this stuff first, call that function, and then use the use the return value um, as an argument to this other function if you're trying to do those two things on, in one bit of code. Um, so you need to get used to the fact that brackets are used in a completely different way from something like Java, Java or JavaScript or Python or Ruby or maybe Ruby's a bit closer. Um, but here, brackets are used to group things together, um, not to say call call this function uh, with the thing on, on the left, or the thing before the brackets being the function name, which is what you're used to from one of those other languages. Uh, you used, used to group things together to say, do, do this bit first, and where do this bit often means call a function with these arguments. But eventually, when you've fought through all that frustration, you are going to make it compile and then you're going to feel like this um, you're going to feel really powerful when you finally get it to compile and when you do get it to compile you're, you're also going to be pretty confident that it does what it's supposed to do and doesn't uh, think mess, uh, doesn't have any uncertainties in it so once you get used to it once you've fought your way through it a few times got something working you're going to feel great about it uh, and it's very rewarding. And well, one of the reasons it's so rewarding is that you can do a lot of really powerful things uh, in the language. So here's an example of um, using the map function. So map is something that um, you, you get this kind of stuff in, in, in the latest versions of Java, Java 8 and, and above. Um, you get this in... Uh, it's available in things like Python, but not necessarily encouraged to be used. You can do things like this in JavaScript, but again, it's up to you whether you use it. Um, but when you're writing functional code, you start to really realize the power of stuff like this. So this, what this map function does is it takes in two arguments. It takes in a function to call and then a list of things to call it on. So um, we're passing in numbers, the numbers 1, 2, 3, which, by the way, notice that quite nice way of saying the numbers 1, 2, 3, just 1, dot, dot, 3 in square brackets. Um, but what we're saying is, for everything in this list, call this function. So double everything in the list. So there you get back a list which has everything doubled in it. Um, and then the second example, uh, 
says for everything in this list do this where do the the thing that you have to do is a little function that you've defined right there in there we're using this backslash which means backslash and then an arrow which means basically means write me write a function right here in the code so what we're saying that what that function does is it takes in an x and returns x squared so what we're saying is for everything in that list of one two three uh square it and then you can see you get the answer once you get used to um, using functions that can take other functions in as arguments, uh, you can start you can start writing the same code over and over, and instead write a function that, that does it once, and just use it everywhere. And once you get used to that, you you miss it any time you're stuck without being able to do it. It's so powerful, and that is rewarding. You can also do really clever things. So here I'm defining something called do twice, and what it what it what it does is it calls the function that you gave it twice. So it basically do twice returns a function which takes in an x um, and calls your function fn twice on x. Don't worry about the type signature there. We'll get to how to understand that. Um, but basically what it's saying is uh, do, do this thing twice. So if we ask it to double 4 twice, we get the answer 16. That's the bottom half of the thing. So basically you pass it, you give it a function and it returns you a function that calls the function you gave it twice on whatever argument you give it. <laughs> and, and maybe I'm making it sound like it's hard, but once you get used to the, these ideas, it's not hard. It just means that you can express concepts you can't express in languages that don't let you do this stuff. And that's why it's rewarding. So um, what we can do is we can actually put that new function that we made in a in a variable. So instead of immediately calling it like I did before, we can we can make a variable called double twice, which which is the result of calling do twice and passing in double. So now double twice is a function that doubles things twice. So basically you can stick things together, um, stick functions together in ways that you can't do in other languages, um, which gives you this real e expressive power, which means that you can write you can express concepts like doing something twice that in other languages you can't do. And once you get used to um, what well, they they call it, they call it high level programming, whatever you want, you want to call it. Uh, they, some people might even call it meta programming, but we won't listen to them. Um, once you get used to it, you're gonna just not understand how you got away with not doing this before. You, the number of times you've written a for loop. Um, that goes through everything in a list, and you think, well, why isn't there just, well, maybe you didn't, but I now think, every time I write a for loop in a language like that, I think, well, why can't I give this thing a name, this idea of looping through everything, and then I wouldn't have to write it out again. So, uh, why does Elm make me happy? Because you have clarity, you have clarity about what is in your model, and how that gets turned into HTML, and what can happen. I think the, the what can happen is particularly important to have clarity about got a list of all the possible things that could happen and how they will affect your model. That means you have complete control over everything that's going on and nothing unexpected can happen. Everything is, is explicitly accounted for in that update function. And that control and clarity gives you confidence that your code actually works and does what you want it to do. If you add to that the expressive power um, of this cool functional language, uh, it, it, when I'm writing Elm code, I feel happy because I feel confident that it's correct and I'm able to use the powerful tools that it gives me. And that's it. I hope I've sold you. Um, uh, there'll be more videos where I go through the real specifics. I'll go through all that syntax stuff that I've touched on um, and talk about, you know, what is a what is a number and all the different types of things you can have, like floating point numbers and strings and whatever and whatever. Um, uh, so I'll, I will go through all that stuff, but my, my first job, I think, was just to persuade you it's worth bothering with the rest. So that's what this video was about. Uh, you, there, there's no uh, need for you to pay any money uh, to me, but if you felt like donating some money to encourage me and help me uh, find time to make more of these videos, please go to the Patreon page um, and sign up to donate, sort of like, you know, one dollar for every video I make or something like that. Um, if you would like to play a fun Android game which also works on the PC, um, uh, have a look on the Google Play Store for Rabbit Escape or go to um, artificialworlds.net slash rabbit, rabbit dash escape. Uh, or hopefully maybe Google for Rabbit Escape, you might find it. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's completely open source. 
um, code and uh, open licensed everything and uh, and it costs 60p to buy it on the Play Store but you can download it for free from the website um, and it's a fun game it's a bit like Lemmings um, if you remember that basically you have to get some rabbits it's sort of a puzzle it's like a puzzle action puzzle game uh, there's a few of us working on it now it's really fun uh, make make new levels for it and get involved with the community you'll love it um, uh, more videos at the YouTube page you can follow me on Twitter I talk about um, I give links to my videos when I make them and stuff like that uh, and general things uh, follow me my blog with the various open source projects that I do I talk about on there and just stuff I've figured out about programming and uh, Linux and things like that. If you want to look at my open source projects, have a look at artificialworlds.net. There's a massive list of projects that I've uh, that I'm working on now, or I was working on in the past. Um, and uh, see you next time.